notes include several pages of the photos that you think were the most pertinent in assessing the trauma to Mr. Zimmerman. Yes, sir. Four of the pages are just photographs. Have we shown those photographs here? Yes, sir. The, the scope of your work, if you will, was to consider the statement that Mr. Zimmerman made to the police about how the um, shooting took place at the moment the shot was fired, and for you to consider the forensic evidence of that gunshot to determine whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's statement about what happened is consistent with the physical forensic evidence. Leading and compound question. Do you understand the question? Yes. Okay, you may answer. Uh, yes, sir. To do that, is it necessary in your mind to review every witness statement uh, regardless of whether they saw the actual moment when the shot was fired? That's correct, sir. Uh, I have to um, interpret the objective evidence. I'm not going to base my opinion on the witnesses because witnesses are wrong all the time. Have you had occasion where you reviewed witness statements, people who claim to have seen something with their own eyes that was absolutely contradicted by the physical evidence that you knew to exist? All the time. The, you know, they'll say they, someone stood over a man and shot him, and uh, two architects and a secretary said that. They saw it. The only problem was is that the bullet taken from the body did not match the gun of the person who supposedly stood him over him and shot him, and the bullet that hit him was a ricochet fire that had to have been fired from 20 or 30 feet away. So that, that's one case, but I've got a half a dozen of those cases. Let's, let's talk for a moment more specifically, since Mr. De La Rionda mentioned them by name. A woman named Celine Bahador testified in the trial and didn't claim to have seen the individuals at the time the shot was fired. Would that matter to you at all? No. Let's talk about Jane Serdica then, for example. Ms. Serdica testified in the trial, and she said she was looking at the individuals outside her window some distance away and believes that she was looking at them when the shot was fired. What she described was that at the time the shot was fired, Mr. Zimmerman was on top of Mr. Martin. Objection leading and mischaracterization of the facts. Can I finish my question, please? Well, if it's a mischaracterization of the facts, I need you to rephrase your question. It's not, Your Honor. Um, I guess that's for the jury to determine, so please rephrase your question. Okay, sure. Ms. Serdica said, she was looking out the window and that she believes she was looking at the individuals when the shot was fired. She said that at the time the shot was fired, that Mr. Zimmerman was on top and that Mr. Martin was face down. Is that possible given the forensic evidence that you know in this case? No, sir, it's not possible. Mr. Martin it's wasn't... Sh he's shot in the front, so... He so would her, her, would her statement have done you any good in this case? No, sir. In fact, that would be an example of how an eyewitness, no matter how well intended, just gets it wrong. Yes, sir. You did consider John... Good's statement to the extent that he was the person. Objection, that's the leading question. Sustained. John Good testified at the trial that when he looked out his back door, he saw the person later identified as George Zimmerman on his back on the ground, and that he saw Trayvon Martin straddling him on his knees. Um, striking Mr. Zimmerman in some sort of MMA style. And then he went back inside 
and some seconds later, the shot was fired. Is the position that Mr. Good saw Trayvon Martin straddling and striking Mr. Zimmerman with Mr. Zimmerman on his back consistent with the forensic evidence that you found at the time of the shot? Yes, sir. That statement, I take it, is separate and apart from Mr. Zimmerman's statement describing essentially the same thing. Right, but again, I would not have used that to give my opinion. I have to use the physical evidence in conjunction with the statement of Mr. Zimmerman. The, you pointed out in your direct evidence that there were two lacerations on the back of Mr. Zimmerman's head and that you testified <coughs> that you believed those two have been from separate impact. Yes, sir. Because you could see the sort of valley in between. Yes, sir. Those were the two blows that created the lacerations. Right, and in addition, they were so separate that if you I impacted one, you couldn't get the other one. Mm -hmm. So there were two reasons. Your, your testimony was that was consistent with having Mr. Zimmerman's head struck at least twice on a surface like concrete. Objection is the leading nature of these questions. Setting the stage for the question. Well, but they're all still leading. You need to rephrase your questions. Is the are the two lacerations with the valley in between on the back of Mr. Zimmerman's head consistent with at least two separate impacts on a surface like concrete? Yes, sir. And is it, I'm trying to figure out a way to ask you about tree branches. <laughs> and, uh, um, were there any big tree branches that you knew in the vicinity of where this happened that were on the ground that could have been used as a club? No. Oh, what you have is tree trunks, to be quite strictly uh -huh. speaking, but there's no tree branches that I could see. That's why when I first answered the question, I said there were no tree branches. So there for, aren't. for Mr. Zimmerman to have received those lacerations on the back of his head because of impact with a tree trunk what would have had to have happened if, in fact, that were possible? You'd practically have to be upright, sitting maybe, because you're going to have to hit the trunk. And you'd have to go back violently against the trunk on the two occasions. So it would still be blunt trauma to the back of the head twice. Or it could have been from hitting his head on the sidewalk. Right. Overruled is argumentative. All overrule is deleting. Please make sure you phrase your questions correctly. Sure. Is that scenario much more plausible and consistent with the physical evidence? The cement is more plausible, especially when you look at the side, the injuries on the side of the head, which wouldn't be tree trunk because you've got punctate, a pattern of punctate abrasions. You commented, of course, that there's a different role that some professionals play in dealing with someone that's been injured. Yes, sir. Whereas you may have a forensic approach, a treating doctor or PA may have a different objective. Now, their object, objective is to treat somebody. My objective is to document the injuries and interpret the injuries. And, you know, they don't care, really which is fine because their job is different than my job. And that's why they're pushing forensic nursing to put forensic nurses in emergency rooms and to document the injuries correctly because they're trained to do that. Uh, but nobody wants to spend the money. <laughs> you had an opportunity to review the physician assistant notes that Ms. Fulgate took the next day? Yes, sir. And did you notice in the notes that she documented what generally would be known as black eyes? Yes, sir. Is that consistent for something that shows up later after receiving a um, blow to the nose? 
it, 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 since it's secondary blackening of the eye, it's, it shows up later. If you punch the eye directly, it'll usually show up immediately. If you punch the nose, the blood generally leaks into the soft tissue of the eye. And so that shows up like the next day or a few hours later. It would not be surprising to you that someone who had sustained the blow to the nose that's shown in the photos the night of February 26, that there might be associated black eyes the next day? No, it wouldn't be surprising at all. Regarding the, the issue of whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's nose was actually deviated or whether it just had some swelling that went down later, is that significant in whether or not he got punched in the face? He'd still been punched in the face. Uh, the reason I say that there's a probable displaced fracture is the next photograph is spent is four hours later and that so-called swelling is gone which most likely represents the fact that the nose was displaced and now it's been put back into position. Within the range of medical possibilities, is it possible that maybe his nose wasn't deviated or if it was fractured it wasn't deviated? Or d Does that matter in the sense of whether or not he got punched in the face? No, he's obviously been punched in the, in the nose and he's been hit in the forehead. That's the injuries up here you're talking about? Yes, sir. The GCS scale of 15, is that a reference to a paramedic note? Is that what that? No, uh, it's probably a check, uh, is an area on the form where, you know, a 15 means they're walking and talking and breathing and they got heart rate and they're not really bad. You know, once you start, most people who come into emergency rooms are 15s. Everybody in this courtroom is 15. To start going down, you have to start getting into trouble. No, I, I take it you're not claiming in some way that Mr. Zimmerman wasn't able to walk or talk that evening, um, notwithstanding his traumatic injuries. That's correct. What I'm saying is the type of injury he would get would be more of a stunning, not a, uh, what most people would think of as a significant concussion. That's why I tended to get away from the word concussion, and I went to the non-medical word, a mm -hmm. stunning type the, of injury. The idea of a concussion that may lead to subdural hematomas, may lead to death, is something that happens after, at some point in time, after the actual impact? Objection, again, leading. Please rephrase your question. Are the consequences of the blow those that develop over some period of time after the impact? Now, usually concussions show up immediately. But the problem is that's that they can be extremely subtle. And that's why sporting events like to have doctors there. Because lay people will look at someone who's got a concussion and will not pick up anything unusual if it's a mild concussion. Mm -hmm. Of course, then as it gets more severe, then it becomes quite obvious. When you're getting hit like that, are you feeling it? Oh, yes. <laughs> are you in some appreciation that you're being injured? Yes. I mean, if you get punched in the nose, believe me, you know it. Does that continue to hurt for a while? Yes, sir. How about when you get your head banged on concrete? Does that hurt then and continue to hurt? Uh, can very well, yes, especially if you've got lacerations. Hurt for a while, yes, sir. Would someone at that moment, when this is actually happening to them, be able to know whether or not what was happening to them was life-threatening? No, because they're stunned and, you know, and you're in pain and you're in fear, so you, you can't interpret. Um, you, you, even, you know, looking at them Outside, someone looking at them can say, oh, they, they're all right, but it happens all the time. You know, people, they think they're all right, and then they die a few hours later. Mm -hmm. That's why the police in this case 
should have taken Mr. Zimmerman to a hospital, not to the police station. Because if he had died in the police station, they would have been sued, and the family would have won the lawsuit because he had head injuries, and that means you take him to the hospital. Even if there's not evidence of a concussion that he's stumbling or falling down or not able to talk? If you have had head injuries like that, you mm -hmm. go to an emergency room. Uh, you don't play around. If uh, some, I mean, it, people die in jail like that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And With the jails always lose the lawsuits, I'm gonna tell you that. Mm -hmm. So if someone is in the process of being hit and having their head struck on surface like cement, they're having this stunning effect and the pain associated with it. In the moment of that, not knowing when it's going to stop, are they able to say, I can take three more of these before I need to do something Sorry, about it? Leading and argumentative. Same. Speculation. Under these circumstances with the trauma that you've seen in this case, would it be somewhat overwhelming the person that's on the receiving end? Same objection. Well, you gave three objections last time, so which one of them is it? Leading and argumentative. Overruled as to both. Yes. There was some there were some questions about the packaging of the evidence, and especially if it's wet and has biological material on it. In this case, there's been testimony that the wet outer shirt in particular was sealed in a plastic bag while wet, and then placed in a paper bag on the outside of that. Is that consistent with good um, evidence handling? No, sir. There was also testimony that when the bag was opened, it smelled very strongly of mold and uh, an ammonia type uh, yeah. odor. Because you, it's decomposing. That's why you don't, you air dry it and you put it in plastic and paper bags, not plastic, because you don't want the decomposition. Is it accepted forensic practice that subjecting evidence to that type of packaging? Now, you can also assume that it was in that condition for roughly a month, mm -hmm. that that would promote degradation or contribute to the likely degradation of the integrity of any DNA evidence on that clothing. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mr. Delarionda mentioned that if Trayvon Martin had put his hand over George Zimmerman's nose at this point in time when there was blood that there may may have been some transfer of blood to Mr. Martin's hands. That's what that question was getting at. Yes. And you think if Trayvon Martin had put his hand over George Zimmerman's nose and mouth when it was in this condition, is it your testimony that there may have been some transfer of blood to his hand? Yes, sir. I take it you would have no additional information as to whether or not Mr. Zimmerman's nose was actually bleeding at some point in time during the, um, uh, the incident. That's correct. I mean, you, you get an uh, impact to the nose. You'll eventually bleed, but I can't tell you if you're going to bleed immediately or not. It just depends on what's and injured. Where that blood goes may depend on the position that your head is in? Yes, it does. Now, you've also talked quite a bit in direct about, I'm sorry, in, in cross, I guess, indirect, about if you find something that's important, but if you don't, the absence of finding it 
doesn't necessarily make the absence of evidence important. Right. That, that, that's a general uh, uh, fact that's understood. Absence doesn't mean anything. Presence does. Because especially if you don't know what the statistical probability that a thing is present is, you know, uh, uh, how often do you actually find something? Like a, a transfer of DNA, how often does it occur? And you have to know that before you can even give a probability. If you haven't done that, you can't even get a given opinion. Do you agree that environmental conditions can affect whether or not DNA is present on physical evidence? Oh, yeah. For example, in this case, you can assume that it was about three hours from the event until Mr. Martin's body was transported. And during that time, while it may have been, the body may have been covered with a blanket or covering on the outside, um, there was a period of time when the body and his hands were exposed to the elements. Right, and, and then it's also how you enclose the body. Do you wrap it tightly or do you put it loosely? Um, you know, again, putting it in plastic containers, plastic tends to rub and be stiff. So, uh, you know, if it's there, it's significant for most things. If it's not there, it's usually not significant. You may also consider on that issue uh, that there's been testimony that the weather conditions varied from a light drizzle to a heavy rain during these events. And would the fact that it was raining to some degree, could that also affect whether or not there's biological or DNA evidence collected from Mr. Martin's hands? That's true. And, and you know, um, or how the hands were handled and things like that. Or perhaps even if they may have been washed prior to being photographed? That's why the forensic pathologist is supposed to be with the body from the time it comes in. You should always be there. You should never leave the body, even if you have assistance helping you. you don't leave the body. You wouldn't trust your assistants to do, well, I, I guess what you're saying is while you may trust your assistants to follow the protocol, you would confirm and verify. Right, like if you want them to, if you want the clothing removed, you examine the clothing on the body before you say, okay, take it off. And then you stand there as they take it off to see if they're doing things appropriately and not maybe throwing it on the floor. You throw it on the floor, anything on the floor is now on the clothing. And then you have it put on a tray, but you don't have the clothing piled on top of each other because if there's some material on one piece of clothing and you put the other piece of clothing on top of it, you can get transfer. So you're supposed to be monitoring this the whole time. Let me show you, uh, Doctor, what's marked as State's Exhibit 28, which has been offered into evidence Objection as... Objection beyond the scope of cross-examination. I don't know what it is. I'll ask the question. The, the, the State's Exhibit 28 has been offered into evidence, and it represents a picture of Mr. Martin's chest taken at the scene by the crime scene technician. And then I'd like to show you State's Exhibit 95, which is uh, in evidence and has been represented as a photograph taken at the time of the autopsy, but before any cleaning or washing was done to the body. If you'll please approach and show the pictures to the court. 